So, um, the day didn't end yet, and I think uh, uh, we have another great afternoon session coming up. We uh, <coughs> will start now with, with talking about more business sides than maybe more the self-care side. Uh, and we uh, have an amazing panel here to, uh, and they will want to share their perspective on career entry. Uh, I want to introduce you to them. Uh, first, I want to introduce you to Pepe. I know your name is actually Jose Louis, but I can say Pepe. <laughs> Everybody can. Pepe is the former CHRO of Heineken here in, in Westchester. Um, uh, he has worked with many expat colleagues and relocation with families. He actually relocated himself a couple of times. So he has a great perspective on, um, on more the relocation side maybe, but also the career re-entry uh, himself. And I want to give him uh, the opportunity to talk about that a bit more. Um, we got to know Pepe, uh, and I was looking it up, Pepe, but we know already uh, in May, we know, about, uh, know each other already a year which is, uh, <laughs> and we're very happy to have you here. Uh, we have a great relationship uh, built with, with Heineken in the meantime, and uh, Pepe is here now to share his story. Uh, then I want to uh, thank Valerie for being here. Welcome, Valerie. Valerie Webb is uh, the uh, head of H HR advisory services and employee relations at Rabobank. I say it in Dutch. Uh, <laughs> Rabobank is, uh, is a, in the Netherlands, uh, a, a very uh, big bank, actually, uh, and I realize when I talk to many of you and many of my friends that Rabobank is maybe not so known in the U.S. as in the Netherlands, but I'm very happy that you're here. Um, uh, Valerie has been with Rab Rabobank already for 20 years, uh, so definitely knows a lot about uh, also, again, relocation of, uh, of uh, uh, people, employees, uh, but she brings the uh, perspective more of balancing the balancing act of working moms. Not, not a returnee herself, but definitely can, can talk about that. Then we have Lisa, Lisa Pent. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. Lisa is the, um, uh, and I don't know if I need to, to say everything, global head of platinum investment planning and performance analysis at Thomson Reuters. Uh, Lisa is a very senior finance executive with roots in investment banking, and we're very interested to hear Lisa's perspective on career re-entry, since we all know that the financial services industry can be tough from a flexible work environment perspective, but also from a career re-entry perspective. So uh, that's the perspective that we would love to hear uh, about from you. Don Perry, thank you for being here. Don is the chief HR officer of P PKF O'Connor Davies. Um, a very large accounting firm, uh, uh, and um, uh, Don is a well-rounded HR professional with extensive experience in accounting and law industry, which is again also an industry we think, or two industries that are um, of a lot of interest for you. We know our members, we know our community, there's a many accounting, uh, former accounting um, and law uh, uh, lawyers here in the room and, and in our uh, community. So again, we would love to hear your perspective. Dawn is also a returnee herself, so that's uh, something that we want to hear about uh, your experience and your challenges and your wins, of course, as well, positive things. And then last but not least, Kelly. Kelly Jocelyn, if I say it right, right? Uh, Kelly is the Chief Talent Officer of MasterCard. Thank you, Kelly, for having us here. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, we, we have already, uh, we have had already an, uh, um, a marvelous day and I think it will be a good afternoon as well. Uh, Kelly actually just joined MasterCard four weeks ago, you said, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, it's really great to have you here. Uh, we know that then maybe sharing a, a lot about MasterCard would be maybe a bit difficult, but uh, definitely hearing your thoughts about your perspective on career entry and, and uh, why you think it's important for you. Um, Kelly has traveled the world a bit as well, relocated many, many times. Um, she comes uh, recently from PwC and, uh, well, will bring you definitely good perspective on, uh, on HR topics uh, for different, uh, of different firms. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. So we want to start the uh, panel discussion with uh, maybe just a question to all of you, uh, if you can just go one by one, why you're here. 
uh, why you think this, this topic is important to you, uh, why you said directly yes when we asked you to come here for this panel discussion and, and talking about career reentry. So Pepe, could you start? Of course. Yeah. I was thinking on ladies first. Okay, not, well, not, did it happen? Sorry. That's, well, I think here we should say men first because <laughs> exactly. you're in the, in the minority. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to have a, this conversation with you. Let me tell you, I'm really positively impressed to, to see the, the group, the magnitude of the group. Why this is important, and, and I will speak more from my personal perspective, but I could say three things. The first one is because it's the right thing and you have the right to. Uh, I truly believe that uh, we have many roles in life, but women has most of the time more challenging and complex roles than men. So many of you made a decision based on priorities to postpone your career for something bigger and more important. Could be family, could be many reasons. So why, when you have the decision to come back, you have the right to be supported and, 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 and let's say supported in one sense. So that's the first one. The second one, just as HR, my God, this is a great opportunity to have access to real mature talent. And I'm talking about maturity on the sense of you got experience and you have been from different situations on the job, on the family perspective, and you can bring that to our companies. And when we are talking about millennials, we are talking about that we need the other side that balance and, and I could say magnify or expand the potential of the millennials. And sometimes it's the expertise that brings, uh, that brings it back. And the third one, it's for me, you have many transferable skills uh, because some of you are on your own businesses. Uh, let me tell you that when I was in the Netherlands, I, 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 I met a lady that she decided to work with the school on the PTA. Oh my gosh, she was running a business more, uh, with more dynamism and more energy than any yep. company. So you develop many transferable skills that are very valuable for, for the companies too. And it's a personal passion. Uh, I will share maybe later, but my, my wife and I have a, a, a group that supports families, and the main reason is starting with women, but that will be later, because yeah, if not, yeah, that will take all the time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Pepe. Valerie, do you wanna? Yeah, so, thank you again for having me. Um, this is a great opportunity. For, for me, from the HR perspective, um, it helps me to understand what's going on from your end. As a recruiter, as a person who's looking to help our business obtain talent, it's great to have these sorts of conversations and to see what's out there. I also refer to the millennials, I'll use the word, I, I'll reference them as the M word, because it, it sounds like, it feels like it's becoming a curse these days, um, that there's such a reaction to them. So there is, this is a great counter reaction, to Pepe's point skills, abilities, experiences, it doesn't need to be necessarily the true technical expertise. What else do you bring to the, to the role that we're not even aware that we're looking for? And all of that happens based on a conversation. So for me, that's real valuable to, to, to continue to have that openness and to continue to, to have these sorts of conversations. And being a working mom, this really um, resonates with me. You know, I, I tried to figure out from when he was a baby, I have a 13 year old, to now and I look at how my career and what I'm willing to do and take on and what I couldn't do has evolved over those 13 years. So, so I get the place that you're all coming from in a different, maybe a little bit different of a fashion. And I, I, I like your point about the technology. I think I wanna park it, but I definitely wanna come back to that because I, I think that is a, topic that we hear from our community a lot uh, about uh, even maybe a bit of insecurity about technology skills. Mm -hmm. um, but let, let's get back to that. I wanna keep it, uh, keep it in mind. And help me because I, my pregnancy brains are sometimes <laughs> a bit forgetting what I'm, uh, but, but keep right. it in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa. Uh, in November, I had an opportunity to attend the Harvard Business School's inaugural class of women on boards. So getting on a corporate board is the next thing I want to do in my own personal career. And there's a fantastic woman named Linda Rabbit who has her own uh, very successful construction company in Washington, D.C., Rabbit Construction. And if you look her up, amazing story. And she basically financed this inaugural class at Harvard. And she said to us on the very last day, here's what I ask of you in exchange for my sponsoring this program. Help one woman every day, each day. And that's what I'm doing today. Great. Hello, thank you again for having me here and thank you for sponsoring. 
I'm Dawn Perry, Chief HR Officer for PKF O'Connor Davies, and the topic for re-entry is really important for two reasons. One, because I did re-enter the workforce back in, I actually left the working um, field back in 2000, and I came back in 2005. And certainly there were some challenges. I left a very senior position, and when I came back, I took a significant pay decrease. I came back two and a half days per week, and I was very fortunate for the last 10 years to get to where I am today. And secondly, I've been in recruiting for over 25 years, and certainly we meet lots of individuals coming back to the workforce, and it's an imperative that we do a good job to help you succeed and to help you get your foot in the door. Thank you. Kelly. Great. Yes. Kelly, Kelly Jocelyn, and clearly uh, the newest to my organization. <laughs> um, but let me just say again, welcome to MasterCard. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here. And had I not been invited to sit on the panel, I probably would have asked to sit on the panel um, <laughs> because I'm super, super passionate about uh, gender more generally. Um, I guess at my most recent experience working for uh, my last organization, PwC, I did about a day a week, a day a fortnight, um, working with UN women, specifically on an equality movement. Um, and that movement is He for She. Who's heard of that? Fantastic. Um, so for those of you that are not aware of, of He for She, it's a global equality movement. Um, and from a corporate perspective, it's very much about getting more women in leadership roles. Um, and as organizations, we have a long way to go. We know based on lots of the work um, from the WEF that uh, women represent 50% uh, of society, um, but that's not the case when it comes to, to the work environment. Um, I am very passionate about helping to encourage the change in gender balance within organizations. I sit on the 30% club, um, which is obviously uh, set up to get greater gender balance on boards, um, et cetera, as well. Part of equality, not only is it gender, but it's also about diversity of the type of work and the type of workers that we have. Um, and the opportunity to get returnees through returnships, um, or in fact just to help and support women who have other challenges in getting back into the workforce is something as corporates that I think we all want to attention. So this is a, a great topic um, and great to hear the perspectives of others that are also really keen to support. Um, so I look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think really for the audience, I think it's Im important to know uh, how you perceive returnees, right? That's, that's what it's all about. These are most of the, the women in, in, uh, in this community, most of the women in our audience are trying to get back in the workforce. So they want to see how do employers look at returnees. Do you, can somebody share uh, if you hired maybe a returnee recently and, and, and how, uh, how that went? What, was there something different in the, in the process? Or can you share some perspective on that? Valerie, I see you I, nodding. Yeah. I, in preparing for this, I looked at our recent hires over the past year just to kind of refresh my memory because we've been hiring a lot of people. And recently I hired three women back into the workforce um, after being out for a variety of reasons. And it was interesting when I look back on my interview notes and kind of what our conversation was, you know, take a, to put aside there the reasons why they were, they were presented, their, maybe their backgrounds from a technical perspective. But it was really the other things that they were bringing to the table. A lot of the, two of the three roles were project roles, and it goes back to running different organizations at your, maybe at your son or daughter's schools, you know, being a part of different committees, maybe a political sort, of, whatever volunteer or other sorts of um, organizations that you were a part of, they were a part of, I should say, when they were out, that was, that sort of kind of resonated to the top of the conversation when you talked about managing projects. So while they were qualified in a lot, of, may, maybe in one capacity, I was starting to look at them from a much broader perspective. And I thought that they actually enriched the organization because they brought managerial skills as well. And I could see them, I then started thinking about succession planning and started thinking about, well, if so-and-so left, this could be a good person. And if so-and-so, and changing the organization as a result of potentially hiring these people, not immediately, of course, but down the road, if, if other things happened. Yeah. I was starting to look at it from a much broader perspective, not just the job. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's. A uh, Lisa, you also nodded, or do you, do you have recent 
No, I have hired, I think, three or four women in the last two years who are returning, and they've all worked out great, and they bring absolutely different uh, flavor to the work environment. And one thing that's really nice is, in my firm, a lot of people have had the privilege of being there for their entire career, so 20, 25 years. So it's nice to have some people who have a fresh perspective, but have the maturity as well. And the, the different flavor you, you mentioned, is that really the, the experience even outside of the workforce that they bring in? Or what absolutely. is it, what is it, what they, yeah. Well, I think it's a lot of different things depending upon what their experience was, but absolutely if the time that they spent away brings a fresh perspective. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think just on that point, actually, I think sometimes we discount what it yeah. is that people do during that time away. Agree. So I really That's like that That's what I actually point, wanted you know? to hear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm happy you do. say that. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I kind of, I'm a bit of a storyteller. Just jump in if I talk for too long. My team are getting used to me quickly. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I notice when I talk to some of my professional girlfriends that have taken time out, um, I need to fess up and say I haven't taken any time out, actually. My children, I went back to work. I have two children and two, two little boys, and I went back to work both when they were very small, and they've, you know, I've had the great privilege of being able to have um, extra care support to help with that, and I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that, so I'm, I'm hugely grateful. And also a husband that took time out, um, so that also, I guess, helps enable. But when I talk to some of my girlfriends around... You know, and they have conversations with me just based on my role about, you know, Kelly, I'm thinking of getting back into work. Um, I've had this time out. It's not always actually for childcare responsibilities, but there's lots of other reasons for taking time out. So when you actually strip back and try and better understand, well, what have you been doing? There's actually some incredible skills that people acquire when they're out doing community service work. You know, I think about some of my girlfriends that have actually been involved in helping to navigate within their school system as well. I mean, it's complex. Um, you know, individuals that have taken time out to go and do some social and society um, things, and also higher education. Um, so I think there's sometimes a little bit of a default when we think about returning women to specifically go, go straight to, well, they've had time off looking after children. That may, in fact, be the case, but I think in many cases there's lots of other things, not only that they get involved in, but that other people get involved in that are unique contributions to bring into corporate life. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that's a, a great... Um, and then, I, I really, uh, Don, I really want to hear a bit more about your... You're actually the only career returner in the panel, uh, but can you, can you explain a bit how you... Yeah, your, your experience in Hatton. Sure, as I mentioned earlier, I left the workforce back in 2001. Just worked really long hours, needed a break. I had a young son at home, and I left the workforce, um, and I became a class parent. I did some volunteer work. I, I worked with Year Up, an organization. I became a mentor. So I, I did do some things while I was at home, and then after my second son was born, I decided I, I really wanted to get back into the workforce. For, and the one thing that I would highly recommend is networking. I kept in touch with all of my former colleagues. Anyone I had met, I always asked for a business card. Obviously, today we have LinkedIn. Back then, we didn't have LinkedIn, so it was a little more difficult. And I wound up having dinner with a, a group of women I had worked with, and someone was looking for an office manager. So I went back part-time, two days a week. And certainly, I have an amazing husband who's extremely supportive. But during that interview process, some of the questions, you know, what did you do? What did you do during the gap? And, you know, when you're a class parent or if you volunteer and you do any of those type of things, talk about it. You develop people skills. You develop, you develop leadership skills, organizational skills. If you're handling the finances at home, talk about that. It's, it's extremely important. And it's been very beneficial for me. I think it's the volunteering is um, me coming from the Netherlands. When we volunteer in the Netherlands, you bake cookies for the street. That's sort of volunteering. When I came here, I was just totally impressed when I heard women in our community talking about it and, and talking a bit like this, like, yeah, I did some volunteer work. And then I asked more, like, what was it? What did you do? And I learned about what PTA is. I learned about what, what organization. It's running budgets of Complex. maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's, to me, not the just volunteering, like you're saying. So be, yeah, be open about it. I think that's, that's a great advice, and that we also give that advice to everybody always in our community. Make sure you talk about it. Um, I think that's... Uh, Can I make a comment just on networking? Because I think that's another one that's really important, and that the other theme that I hear with women that are coming into return-to-work programs is that they 
um, often is not as well networked and they've lost some of those business networks that are really instrumental, I think, in helping make connections. We know men and women network differently anyway. And in fact, men are often better networked, which means they hear and come across opportunities sometimes earlier than women do. And that's even within the work environment. So networking is something that I would, I mean, I think that's probably one of your biggest wins, no doubt, but is keep your networks up. But join some networks outside those networks that are the norm. So don't just go to women's networks. Find other networks with other communities that you also can join or latch on to somebody that you know has a network and ask them to take you along. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. May I add uh, on yeah. this topic yes. because I, I think you are totally right. Two elements, so it's your friends. Uh, and, and as I said, the girlfriends and the, the boys' friends that you have that are in business, just sharing your ambition, and they know you really well. They share you, they can see your strengths, and they will start having you in mind. And second is, let me tell you, unfortunately, and I speak uh, on behalf of the function, I apologize because what I experience is uh, recruiting people. It's so pragmatic that they are just sometimes just looking for the right words that matches your profile with the requirement of their customers and they do not necessarily consider the, the resumes and, and we lose a lot of opportunities to attract great talent into the organization. So in these two elements, is, for me the message is networking is a much better uh, strategy. You have a good network because you have a lot of connections, I'm sure, and just start sharing this ambition and someone will come with a good advice or someone will refer you with someone else and it's the best way to get uh, the right conversations. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's also what we believe by, by uh, providing our vermilion process, if I, may, if I may. As soon as you know what you want to do, you need to be in front of people. As soon as they see you and they see you talk and you're mature and you're confident and you know what you want to do, they, they hire you on the spot. That's what my belief is. But sending in resumes and applying via LinkedIn, or that, that doesn't work with, with the, 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 the type of resume maybe that you, that you have. So that's, that's, I think, is also a good point to... Um, I, it's almost, I mean, it really goes quick, but we want to go to breakouts as well, and we want to give you the opportunity to talk almost one-on-one. -on -one. It's ten-on-one -on -one, uh, with uh, each uh, uh, panelist and also with uh, some other MasterCard uh, uh, people, uh, employees who will, who will join you. I want to ask one last question, and that is for anybody who wants to, what are some initiatives that your companies are, are um, uh, having to promote women and maybe not per se women returning to work because I know that's pretty much now a hot topic and there are not there there are definitely some companies who have programs but uh, not every company has that yet but are there any initiatives that you want to share with the group on what you're doing with uh, the company you work with is there anything that you want to share about Heineken <laughs> not anymore no, sorry anymore. Okay. <laughs> I, I have not Just the right try, sorry I I give it a they try. are great but they are a great <laughs> yeah. company for sure yeah I, yeah, yeah. certainly we, we have uh, flexible work options, which have worked out really nicely for returning women and, and even for in-house employees. Um, and you can work 20%, 40%, 50%, as much as, you, as much as you'd like. And if you're working over 30 hours per week, you're eligible for benefits as well. We've rolled out paid parental leave as well. Um, we're putting some really nice things together. We don't have backup childcare at this point, but we're working on that as well. Sounds great, yeah. We, we do it, we MasterCard yeah, too. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we're piloting a scheme in our London office at the moment. Um, I think it was Goldman Sachs that coined the term the returnship. Um, but we have a returnship program um, that we're running in London. We actually have four women and one guy, um, which is interesting. So a, a, a man that's returning to, to the workforce. And we're looking at that pilot and some of the learnings from that in order to scale something out that's bigger, broader, and, and, and wider at MasterCard. My last comment and my top tip would be around confidence. Um, I think the other thing, it's, it's really hard, I think, when you've had some time out, um, having the confidence to trust yourself, um, to know that you actually know a lot of really great things and have some incredible skills. And there are plenty of ways to help you re-upskill to get back into, it, back into the workforce and, and into an organization that's right for you. I think there's some research that only about 24% of returners that have had a career break actually go back to their same employer, which suggests actually that people are looking for something new and something different. And as employers, we too are looking for something different. And we certainly need more women in the workforce. 
If any of you um, have read the book The Confidence Code by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman, it's a really good one because it talks about the difference when you're competing also against, you know, men, um, other women, etc. just what the differences are from a gender perspective. Men tend to lead more with confidence and women with competence, which yep. means they trust themselves, so, or we trust ourselves, I should speak, to, speak as myself as a woman, um, sometimes to actually have the confidence to, to apply for something that you may not ordinarily um, throw your hat in the ring for. Um, have a look at that book, it gives you some super tips on confidence and it's really important. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for being here today and supporting women returning to the workforce. And I really appreciate everything everyone has to say. And then Kelly wanted to kind of connect on what you said about confidence, which I agree with you on, that that is probably one of the most important factors. So I'm on the advisory board of the Stanford University Clayman Institute on gender differences, and they also speak a lot about women leadership. And I was, or they have a center for women leadership. And I was just there at a conference um, which was called Beyond Bias. And I think that uh, confidence is a hugely important factor. I think there's still a lot of research out there. There is definitely still quite a bit of unconscious bias. So I kind of wanted to hear how, especially in this return field, how you're dealing with that and what your thinking is about that. Are you experiencing that or not? What is your thinking about that? Do you want to talk about your program, seeing as it's established? Or? Not necessarily at this firm, but uh, previously, we, under our diversity and inclusion, we had um, gender uh, unconscious bias um, presentations. We also did gender intelligence, and it was really interesting to see the results. And, and, and it was both for men and for women. And you know, when you talk about the unconscious bias, we did, um, we, we had everyone close their eyes for a moment, and we said, you know, the, the, pre, the presenter said, you know, just picture that you're in a courtroom right now and there's a judge, there's a defendant, you have two lawyers, a stenographer, and everyone said what color was the judge, the defendant, and it was very, very interesting. We also did some um, research with two resumes, exactly the same, two different names. Yeah. I cannot tell you, under Dawn Perry, there were two eras, you know, under the other person with a different name, caught all 20. So when you talk about unconscious bias, it's definitely out there, and it's something we have to work on. I know that Rabobank's also, right? It's, it's also we're, we're rolling out a um, global diversity initiative. Um, the conversation was around the word global, because there's a lot of laws in the US. We live in a, so it was the education. And we actually just ran our pilot. And it, it he, it, it went men and women, it went, he, he really did a great job. He had us break up into groups and it was even, who plays golf? You make certain assumptions. Do you feel excluded if you don't play golf? You know, are you the firstborn in your family? Then you start thinking about how the person reacts. You know, how the person maybe reacts to something due to the birth order. So there were all these sorts of things that go along with kind of your consciousness about biases or how you perceive people. Then he had us do another exercise, and I was the only w woman at the table with a table of four men, and I played the role of a man, and they were all women. And the, he gave us a scenario. And it was interesting, and I was trying to process as a man, and I kept going back to my female reaction to things. <laughs> you know, I was trying to solve everything, and I was trying to please everybody at the table, and they were looking at me like I was crazy. Like, why would you even think like that? Because they were thinking, like, it was very hard to switch off who we are. So, but it's an education, it's an awareness, it's a constant dialogue that's going on. And I think as organizations, we're trying to do that much better as well. I know I can speak to my, one of my former firms, and that's very much trying to understand our data. Um, if we look at our acquisition figures and where people are coming from, really getting to the root cause. Um, I, you know, it's, I talked about this at a conference in Canada that I was at recently, but um, my last employer, we noticed or that there was a perception in the organization that women left at greater rates than men. Um, and some of that bias or that perception was around, well, of course we must lose more women um, because they have other family responsibilities. 
when we actually looked at our data, we actually found that men and women left at exactly the same rates, but we were replacing more of those roles with male hires. Um, and so we took some of that data then to the boardroom, looked at our understanding of un our unconscious bias training specifically with recruiters and with hiring managers and really focused in on that. Um, so certainly getting your head around the data and really understanding, hmm, have we got a bias there? What's the reality? Certainly I found is really important, shifting the status quo. The, yeah. So, so Lisa, do you want to share a last sort of tip before we go to the breakouts? For, for women returning to work to get back to the, <laughs> the... The number one thing that I see, and it's both for women that I mentor uh, within my organization and outside, if you look at a job description and it has 10 things on it, and you think you can do six or seven, and you don't know if you've, you know, you've never done the other three or four, don't not apply. Because think about all the things you can do that aren't in those bullets that you're bringing to it. And if you have the, if you marry that with confidence, when you go in and you meet with the person, they're gonna focus on those extra things that you're bringing to the table. They're not gonna focus on those three or four things. Don't forget that. Yeah, that's also a very good point. Do you want to do a last point, Pepe, before we? Yes, for <laughs> sure. Uh, and I promise to, to share, but uh, uh, you share a lot of this topic. It's. Uh, my wife, and, and she's a wonderful woman, I respect her a lot, and we made a decision. So when we got married, uh, we have four kids, and she said, you know what, that's a priority. But I got a very good advice that we have been practicing since then. It's, uh, it was suspected that my career will continue. She's brilliant, and she's smarter than me. I just was smarter once when I asked if she would marry me, and she said yes. <laughs> For the rest, she, she is, she's the smartest. But let me tell you, is the, the advice from this person, uh, uh, an executive from Mexico, is we need to ensure that we provide the space at home to keep growing together. So my wife, uh, in these uh, 20 years that we have married, uh, she got a master's degree. We, we work with families. Uh, we, 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 we went to Navarra University for a master's degree. One of the reasons was exactly what you described. We believe that women's self-esteem, in, in general for people, but for women is the most powerful uh, strength that you have. But at the beginning, it's so fragile, like a glass. But when it's strong, it's like a diamond. You cannot break it. So in this process where you are, and that would be maybe my advice, and it's what we try to do through this uh, nonprofit organization called Better Families, it's how you help, just in the easy day to day, try to learn something, and you remember the who you are. What you mentioned, leadership, is not, it's not a skill, it's the who you are. You lead by your values, the way, the confidence, the way you listen to others. And in, in the master, and this is what I love the most, and I will close with this, nice. my, my, one of my teachers, uh, Mr. Escriba, he, he used to say that women are more human than men. Why? Because we are more depart departmentalized in general, so we keep the relationships very easy. That way, you are more holistic in general, and that makes uh, women more human. And the way you create an environment at home, with friends, at the office, trust me, it's, it's invaluable. So if me, my advice for you is, if you have the opportunity, whatever you want to do, try to identify. There are a lot of courses now on the internet. Some of them are free. Some of them, uh, uh, there is a company called, or a university called Coursera, Coursera. They are not so expensive, certified but uh, big universities. So you can start just going back, try to go to the areas where you would like to learn. And this is a good element to present yourself. And second, make your list. Which are you, the, the three things that people love from you? And read it every day in front of the mirror, and trust me, that will help a lot. Thank you. I, I, I want to leave it to this. I can't say it better than you did. <laughs> you did. What I want to do is uh, start a breakout. What means uh, if you, with your table, can come up with a couple of questions that you want to talk about with the IHR hiring manager that will join you. So you will see the picture and the name uh, of who will join you uh, on your table. Um, if you could just come up together with the table with a couple of questions because we only have half an hour and we want to, we want to make sure that everybody gets the opportunity to ask the question that they want to ask. Uh, then I give you five minutes to go to your table and, uh, and have a great conversation.
Thank you. Is there something, and I, I can't ask all of you, but is there something that you really want to share that you heard on the table that was something interesting, something that you said, hey, that's great actually to share with the bigger group as well. Some conversation topics, tips, tricks that you were um, hearing on the table. Yeah, you want to? Well, I, we had a great table of women, so thank, thank you for being here. Uh, but I think a theme that we all agreed to is that we have to stop being apologetic as women for the time that we've taken off. So during interviews, to make sure that you talk about it and you move on from there and you don't hang on an apologetic tone. Uh, you've got great experiences to bring and to continue on and you've got to keep that in mind in your efforts. I think it's great. That's a great, uh, great point. Is there something else that somebody, yeah, Susan? Yeah, thank you. So at our table, we talked a little bit about the brand of MasterCard in the community. And we got a lot of questions. I got a lot of questions about, are we really willing and open-minded to have or host our own returnship? Or would we ever hire someone who is out of the workforce? So that just tells me that we have some of our own work and thinking to do, not just on how we feel about this topic, but I think how we're willing to show up with uh, you know, women in the community, and I think we have some brand work to do there. So just something that's top of mind for me, and I thank you for sharing all of your opinions and insights. Great, great. Is there something you want to share? Yeah, actually, now we go to hold. <laughs> but let, let's do two more, and then we... <laughs> we. We were discussing a lot about the recruiting process, and one of the themes that came up at the table was a real focus on online job postings and applications. And it really needs to be broader than that. Um, I would recommend that you not make that the majority of your focus. Really work your networks. Come in, uh, you know, to uh, events and meetings like this in the community, um, and reverse engineer your search. So, meaning, identify the companies that you really want to be a part of, and figure out how to get in through your contacts, as opposed to just applying online. So we talked a little. We talked a little bit about that as well. We also talked about options. Don't just pursue one option. Keep several options open. Even if you're close to an offer, never shut the door until. Don't never say done until it's done. Keep all the balls in the air going because you never know. Things, so, life happens and things can change. So several options, never targeted. Or never close. Well, we, we discuss uh, some strategies of uh, how to build network because we realize that networks, uh, networking makes the difference. The, I think the key elements are it's feel confident, don't feel embarrassed to us. We know that people in general want to support and to help others. So if we ask for support, not for a job, if we ask for advice, I don't remember exactly the phrase that you use. But that's fantastic, I and uh, so I think for us is networking and feel confident to us and share your ambition. You should be really proud that you are coming back to, to your career or you want to change career expectations or, or uh, priorities. So if you share that, someone will know someone that will connect you with an opportunity. We had a great table, thank you ladies. We talked a lot about resume writing and certainly adding accomplishments and results to your resume. It's really important. So I'll agree with Kristen in terms of reverse engineering. We, we touched a lot on um, researching the types of companies that are interesting um, and also figuring out what about those companies' mission statements and their values is reflective of your own. And then coming to those networking conversations, those 15-minute catch-up conversations. This is why I want to work for your company. I believe in the same things that you believe in. And that's, that's how you start to build those connections. And then after those initial conversations, who's the next person? You know. What departments line up? Is there somebody else that you think I could speak with? And, and don't be afraid to ask for that next conversation. Don't let it die at that first networking. And just plant that next seed, I think, is really important. Like Anshu already mentioned in the beginning, um, the, the topic or the theme of the Women's History Month this year is national um, is trailblazers. And it's also about making sure that there's equal pay and equal, uh, equal pay for women. And that's exactly what Roly will talk about actually now. So that's why we thought it's great to have Roly here to talk about this topic. Thank you, Roly.
Everybody can hear me? I can move around? Yeah. Right? OK, OK, wonderful. Well, good afternoon. And thank you so much for inviting me and Barbara. And as, uh, so uh, as was pointed out, AUW stands for the American Association of University Women, which is a nationwide nonprofit. And it's a very large nonprofit of 170,000 members and supporters throughout the country. We have uh, 1,000 branches, and we have various state organizations. So I'm the president of AUW of New York State. And within New York State, we have 31 branches or chapters. We have a large one here in Westchester County, which has nearly 200 members. And the, so AUW is uh, one of the leading voices, is one of the leading voices in the nation on issues of gender equity. And so we, we work hard on equity for women and girls. That's our mission, especially in the fields of education and the workplace. So um, one of the many programs, uh, we have a, a variety of programs in encouraging women in STEM fields, and then, but pay equity is very big for us. Uh, we have a, a salary negotiation workshops, which are two hours in length, typically, and I'll just give you in this 25-minute, uh, 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 half-an-hour talk that I have here, I'll just give you some tips out, out of that. Uh, so, but we have two flavors of those. One of them is work smart, which is for women who are already out in the work field and maybe looking to change jobs or apply for a new job, and that we call work smart. And there's another one which we call start smart, which is for women who are still in college and looking for their very first job. So, in, uh, so who enjoys sa negotiating their salary? <laughs> okay. So it's like pulling teeth, right? So there are, uh, you know, so there are, uh, but everybody knows what salary negotiation is, right? Like it's just a conversation that a potential employee and an employer have, that you're being hired to do a certain job, and you're going to be paid a certain amount to do that job, and it's just a conversation about what skills you bring, and therefore what you should be paid. And it's reaching that process of agreement. And so we're going to uh, talk about, uh, uh, before I get into the four steps of salary negotiation, uh, I guess everybody knows, right, that women are not paid the same as men. And the gender pay gap is that the women's dollar is chopped off a little. How much is it chopped off? Well, a Hispanic or Latina woman can expect to make 54% of what a white man would make for the same job. An African-American woman can expect to make 63% of what a white man would make. And even within the, the same category, you, uh, you know, even within the same category, let's say if you say a Hispanic woman and a Hispanic man, then the woman would make less than the Hispanic man would make. But the percentages here are all, uh, you know, as compared to white, white men. So this, that's not good. And the thing is that, you know, people say, well, you know, women look after the family, women do this, that, and therefore they're paid less. But the point is AAUW's research shows that this happens right off the bat. As soon as they come out of college, there is a wage gap. So that cannot be attributed to women, you know, uh, you know having been t taking time out, off for care or for any of those things. There is definitely a bias factor. There is definitely a perception factor. As one of the panelists pointed out, you take the same resume, put a man's name or a woman's name on it, it gets perceived differently. And therefore, the salary that then it's judged to have to need a different salary because the perception is different. And then, so that's when you start out. And every year, you know, your raise is based on your previous salary. And then also then perceptions like, okay, maybe for the same behavior or same work, a guy is a leader, a woman is a hard worker. So then maybe he deserves the promotion more than she does. But over a period of time, all that builds up. 
And there we have, 10 years later, 50,000 or more. OK, so what are we going to do about negotiation? The very first step is, what is, what is the basis of one's salary? The basis of one's salary is the skills one's bringing to the job, one's strength. And so that is uh, something that we have to, the first tip about salary negotiation is way before the negotiation even begins. And that's knowing what one's strengths are. So what I'd like each of you to do, take a minute to think of, if you were, think of a job that you are either thinking of applying to or a, a job that you already have, and what do you think are your three top strengths uh, that, that make you very strong in that job? Would someone, uh, I mean, it's a big group, but would someone like to volunteer to say what it is? So here's um, helping you put together an elevator pitch for yourself. Some of the other speakers have also uh, mentioned that, that it's good to have a short way of saying, okay, here, you know, no, these are my strengths, and how can I say it? So uh, anyone want to say? Any volunteers? No, not so much. Okay. <laughs> Next thing is, know your market. What, for those, for the kind of job you're looking for, what does the market pay? So, so one has to do some research. That's called uh, benchmarking your, your uh, salary. So, for instance, there are many kinds of jobs out there, right? A doctor's job, a nurse's, a, a, a nurse, an accountant, a, a, a in the financial market, engineer. So each of each different, and then and then everybody has a certain level of. Uh, uh, experience in it. So you're at a certain, within a certain job title, you're also at a certain level of uh, professional uh, maturity or experience. And all those things uh, in, in the market have different salaries. And so you need to know what that is. Because you cannot negotiate without having a clue of what is the correct salary one should be getting. So there are a variety of uh, databases or websites out there. For instance, there's salary.com, and if you go there, you can pick your geographical area. Why do you want your geographical area? Because salaries are different in the more expensive areas and in the cheaper areas. And so, uh, and, and, and then you can enter the job title, and, and you get a, a profile of your salary. So that's called benchmarking your salary, and it's really important to know what that is. So basically, out of all this research work, you use databases available like salary.com or like Glassdoor. And also, don't forget like about talking to friends, talking to people who are maybe perhaps working in that company or in similar fields. What is a reasonable uh, salary to expect? And then you say, OK, so based on all this, I know that for my experience and for this particular job, this is a reasonable, is that $100,000? Is that $75,000? Is that $50,000? Is that $200,000? What is a reasonable salary for me to expect? And what is a range around that number? You know, well, if somebody is going to offer me less than this, well, I'm walking away. You know, when do I know that, yeah, I've been made a good offer, and when do I not know that I've been made a good offer? Because you know, if, if you've already been given a super great offer and you start negotiating, well, that sounds greedy. On the other hand, if you sort of got a bad offer and you don't negotiate, you're leaving money on the table. Okay, so, so then, so that's, now you know your strengths, you know your market, and then now we get into negoci uh, negotiation strategy itself. Uh, so, uh, what are we, um, here's what the life cycle is. First, you're looking for a job, right? See what uh, jobs are out there. So you're not even in front of your potential employee here. There's nothing to negotiate. You're just figuring out what job to apply for. The next is you apply and you interview. 
So are you going to negotiate for a salary here? Like you walk into somebody, you know, for an interview. By the way, before we talk further, I'm not going to work unless I get $100,000. Nah, that, that doesn't work, right? Like unless, unless uh, there isn't an offer on the table, there's nothing there. So the first thing is, it, well, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about the job, and I have the, these wonderful skills that let me do an excellent job for you. So it's all in terms of what is the employer looking for and that how good of a job can be done. You're making the sale here, you know, and, and uh, you know, one is, uh, uh, and this is too soon to talk about salary. Now, then the next step is that if the employer says, well, yes, we would like to hire you, and we would like to pay you this much, or at least that's when the negotiation, so there has to be that, yes, uh, you know, we would like to hire you, and there is a first offer, so you wait for the employer to name the salary first. So here's the thing, that suppose that you haven't got your job offer yet, you're before that, and you're talking about um, your, uh, you know, you're, you're still interviewing, but the employer uh, starts asking salary questions, how would you answer that? There's no offer on the table. Another thing you can say is let's talk about, because you're still interviewing, Let's talk about the job requirements first. Let's first talk about, uh, you know, so you, you, you can deflect it in that way as well. Could you please tell me your salary history? Well, yeah, in fact, in some places, they're now passing laws that you're, you're not allowed to ask salary history. So, uh, so this may, may become a question for the birds here, but, but otherwise, again, one can just go back to, uh, let's talk more about the job, or, or I'm flexible, or I'll take a market salary. I need to know what salary you want in order to make your an offer. And again, something similar, you know, I will accept a competitive market salary, or something like that. Okay, so then there is the job offer. So now what? So now there is a number. There is, we want to hire you and we want to pay you so much. Well, back comes all that research. What is that number? Where does it fit on my target salary and the range and all that that I had in mind? Is, that, is it a good offer? Is it not, you know? And also, it's all right to say, that uh, can I think about it and get back to you? It's not like, oh, I must respond right now. So that's something also like having the confidence to say, okay, can I, can I think about it and, and get back to you in a day or two? And, and, and that's just fine. But, but that's the time when, when one evaluates, okay, is this a good offer or is this not a, a good offer and do I want to negotiate? And if you decide, well, this is low, then one needs to persuade. And, and again, it has to be back again with one's skills. You know, what are my strengths? What can I do for you? What makes me a good employee? Why you should consider giving me a, 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 a better offer that I have done my research. And according to my market research, this is uh, on the low side. So would you be able to do something about that? Something like that, like, like done politely, not offensively, not aggressively, but nevertheless make the, make the point. And it must be in terms of one's skills, not, well, you know, the rents are so high and my childcare bill is killing me. And you, you know, the none of, it's not that I need the money to do X, Y, and Z, but I deserve, you know, that I will bring the skills and make it worth your while. Uh, Okay, and then don't forget benefits. So salary is only a part of one's total uh, package, and there is a, a lot in, in any typical package. There's uh, uh, about 50% of the salary, you know, most can come in benefits. Some benefits are not, um, depending on the kind of company, some may not 
some are not negotiable, like there may be standard plans for healthcare or um, you know, there may be a standard vacation policy or whatever, but some things can be like, like flexible time or, 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 or sometimes, uh, you know, uh, there, there may be money for if you want uh, higher education and some time off for that and some funds towards that. So those are things that, uh, you know, uh, one must keep in mind when negotiating as well. And then get it in writing when all is done. So finally, like you had an initial offer, then you negotiated, and then you came up with a new and perhaps different agreement. Get that new and different agreement in writing. Okay, I'd like to spend a few minutes on stereotypes and double bind. Is there, can, can, can it uh, go wrong? Can negotiating for salary go wrong for women, especially? Right, right. That, 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 you know, that, that, uh, that's a good point. That women, uh, well, the, the, what's being said is that women often uh, underestimate and don't, don't, don't ask because they say, oh, no, I can manage in less, or, you know, uh, why should I ask? Um, the other thing with, uh, with stereotypes and uh, double bind is that it can play another way that, you know, for the same behavior, a woman can be seen as being, oh, pushy, while a guy is oh, being, um, uh, you know, assertive and a leader. So, so, so there is, so, so women have to be a bit careful in negotiation uh, situations to keep, like, like what kind of tone is used, what kind of, that, that, that you, you keep it, um, you know, you don't hesitate, don't back off from making your point. Make your point, but has to still be done sort of politely and, uh, you know, be persuasive and, and, and yet uh, uh, this, uh, persuasive, say your point, but not uh, come across as pushy. And it's a very, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a problem. Women shouldn't have to face this, but, you know, but, but that's, uh, you know, but that's the reality that the same behavior in women does get judged differently. Okay, and then the last point uh, I'd like to make is that it's good to practice negotiation. Negotiation, it is, especially for women, it is hard for us to sell ourselves. You know, women are great negotiators when they're negotiating for somebody else. Like if they're working on, you know, behalf of a company, you're saying, okay, what wonderful things our company does, we do, that they're very good at. When it comes to saying, I'm wonderful and I deserve this, that's difficult. And so it is good to practice. So one thing you can do is just practice with a friend. One person plays a potential employer. One person plays the employee. And then you say, well, OK, here's the target salary that's being offered. And the other person tries reasoning through. Well, so, so that can be reverse roles. But before going into uh, you know, a negotiation situation, practice is, can be very helpful. So, so these are my uh, uh, some uh, quick uh, tips and remarks, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Roly. Thank you for okay. sharing uh, sharing this perspective. I think it's it's sort of to round up the whole uh, day. It's in the end, if you find that offer, if you get that offer, then it's really important to know how to react to it, right? Right. It can still go wrong. You went all that, all, you went through the whole journey and it would be just really a bummer <laughs> if that like, wouldn't work out. So thank you so much for your, for your perspective, for sharing your yeah. perspective.